Good to know. Uh, I posted a link to the agenda to which I personally have added no items, but I figure if you want to put your name on the attendees list. Hmm. Um, I know Tim had something on here about walking through the backlog. So I pasted a link to the project board and um, I added all of the issues or PRs that have area conformance since I last looked at the board, uh, which brings us to a grand total of 49 issues to be triaged. Um, and then I wasn't sure if Srini, you had mentioned something on the mailing list about maybe updating us on Globant. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I've been um, attending the Globant meetings on Thursdays uh, for the last few weeks. Um, and uh, we, they are working. Um, Pretty good team. Uh, I just have to say that first. Um, they, are, they have done pretty in-depth analysis on some of the problems like pod life cycles, pre stop hook. Uh, they found out there are some behavioral things and they did a few PRs in there. Um, apparently, uh, one of the problems we are facing is essentially the uh, PRs are there's a lot of time it's taking for the reviews to happen. So um, some of the issues like, you know, you have to keep rebasing these and then uh, hoping that somebody will review is taking a bit of time. Uh, other than that, the work is going great uh, out there. So they, they're working on um, uh, also the DNS uh, tests uh, one of the things that are happening there is that um, a lot of these tests that we are running into, they could be Linux only kind of tests. So, uh, or with, should they be validation tests? So that, that's a point I want to discuss a little bit because we're not sure um, how to approach those. Uh, I'm talking about the existing tests and we are also writing new tests in there. So. We in the sense that we have folks. So. so one approach I am going with is like for storage, we are, I'm working on some tests and uh, I'm tagging it as storage validation tests. Uh, so that, you know, there's a validation suite that goes and then we can eventually tag them as Linux only if, if we need to, or is that the right approach or? So usually we just write the test and then promotion comes later, right? The conformance right, right. Promotion comes later. Yeah, so I'm, I'm means... talking about the existing test. Okay. So during promotion to conformance, maybe we can tag it as Linux only if at that time we figure out that it's Linux only. That's what it feels like to me because that's when the Windows guys are going to be affected, right? Right. That makes sense. So, but uh, okay. So something I haven't had a chance to look at too in depth, but I've had a couple PRs float by that start to introduce the Linux only tag. Um, it's unclear to me whether or not that tag is getting introduced because it's a behavior that Windows will never, ever, ever do, or if they're just trying to get it over the line and get this particular Linux variant of the test through versus a Windows variant of the test. So the one I most recently ran into is uh, a test that was related to uh, DNS um, was split up so that uh, previously, the test looked for both DNS and Etsy hosts, and then it was split up into a test that looks for cluster DNS and then also looks for entries in Etsy hosts. And the Etsy hosts test uh, was tagged as Linux only um, because Windows can't mount individual files for pods. Mm -hmm. And I see Brian raising his hand in response to that. Take it away, Brian. Yeah, so I reviewed a lot of these test changes to tag tests with Linux only, including that one. Um, the I pushed the Windows folks pretty hard to get a very detailed description of what 
is possible today and what will ever be possible and why, what the reasons are for the limitations for Windows. So please refer to the KEP and if something is not clear from the Windows support KEP, we should get it added to the KEP. They've been very good about adding additional levels of detail like the latest one is ICMP support, which actually isn't even well documented anywhere for Linux or otherwise. Um, the on the Etsy host issue, the the yeah, it is limited by the single uh, file mounting problem, and there are quite a number of features that are in that bucket. Uh, quite a number of changes need to be made, and a number of components to make that happen, as as has been explained to me, um, and that is kind of summarized in the cap. So it falls into a big bucket. You know, there were claims made that maybe OS changes even were needed. That's not 100% clear in terms of what OS change means in that context exactly, um, like how deep of a change that would be. Uh, but it's definitely not a Kubernetes only change that would be required. Um, so I would su suggest that we just tackle all of those at the same time if somehow that becomes feasible in the future. They should all be labeled with the reason that, uh, you know, this is marked Linux only due to the single mount file thing. So it should be possible to find them, maybe not fully automatically uh, because there's not like a tag for that specific issue, but they all have English text that explains that. In, in the comment section, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so any, for anything, I, any test that got Linux only, I asked them to enumerate all the reasons why it was marked that because for some things, there were multiple reasons, like this requires privilege and it requires single mount files and it requires you know, some third thing in some cases. Um, so all of them should be tagged to the best of our ability with all of the reasons why they are Linux only. And is, does that show up in the description field that is parsed out into the conformance docs? Excellent question. Okay. I mean, was your, my, my, I would assume we would want that information to show up in the conformance docs. Was that your intent? Um, and sure the conformance docs are the thing that scrape the tests and lay down an ID, the name of the Ginkgo test, and then the description stuff uh, in the release that the test was added in. Is that right, Serini? That's correct. I don't, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I agree there needs to be an automated way if we were to, you know, try to ascertain conformance for Windows. There need to be an automated way to sort that out. But given that it's not part of conformance yet, I didn't worry about that step yet. Like we haven't figured out if it's going to be additive or orthogonal or whatever even, right? Okay. Um, Srini, do you maybe want to take an action item to have the Globant folks confirm that that has been done? I will, yeah. I'll have to figure that out. Okay, if you can make an issue and then tag it as area conformance and add it to the backlog, that way we'll know it's an outstanding piece of work uh, and that it's getting worked on. Sounds good. Also, hi, I really didn't want to run this meeting because I'm not super actively involved. I'd love to hand stewardship of this over to somebody else, but I see Tim's name is on the other two agenda items and he's not necessarily here. Uh, I did just want to point out that code freeze is coming up uh, in the next week and a half. So if we do want to push to get any more conformance tests added, now would be the time to uh, help with the review problem that Srini mentioned. Uh, I too encountered uh, review bandwidth issues and just general shepherding and ping-ponging PRs across a bunch of different SIGs to help out the globe and contractors. Uh, looking at the existing conformance test dashboards on TestGrid, it appears as though the 113 release of Kubernetes contains 214 conformance tests and the 114 release of Kubernetes as it is currently standing contains 216 for a grand total of two additional conformance tests. I feel like we could be doing better. 
Well, yeah, as soon as the reviews happen, probably we'll have a lot more than that. What active steps are you taking to ensure reviews happen? I actually, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do is probably get to this individual SIG meetings and uh, try to bring up this issue. That's, um, I haven't done that yet, but um, um, that's probably the best way because uh, on the issue itself, uh, responses could be uh, meager. So, uh, so um, one, so sorry, I had an interrupt when you were mentioning the review problem. Yeah, so there, the process is, are these new tests that are being written? In um, which case they're not even conformance yet? There are, um, there are all, uh, yeah, there are existing tests that, uh, table tests that are converted to individual tests and there are tests that are, um, that are written recently for the, uh, for the um, pod lifecycle. And yes, there are tests that requires to be reviewed and added. Uh, so can I maybe take a step back and ask, uh, hands up, who here has been reviewing Kubernetes tests or P uh, conformance PRs in the past month? Srini, I can't see your hand, so you're not on video. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not reviewing. So, um, uh, okay. When I get tagged, I review. Otherwise, I'm not actively uh, going for them. So of the 12 people attending this meeting, there are only two people who are even bothering to drop LGTMs is what I'm hearing. And I feel like perhaps we could do a better job of addressing that. Yeah, so process wise, what I generally do is, you know, if it's a new test or it's a significant change, even a refactoring to an existing test, I make sure that a domain expert in the SIG looks at it. Right, because just as one example uh, that I like to pick on uh, was there were some changes being made to a networking test and they said, well, all these things don't need to be privileged and the test still passes. But actually what the test was doing was trying to connect to the cube proxy port on the same host and it was totally unclear that the test was at all doing the same thing anymore <laughs> with the changes that were made to the test. Right, so we need to get the attention of the folks in that SIG, and I strongly recommend not relying on GitHub notifications. I will not look at anything if you just tag me through a GitHub notification. I am signed up for like tens of thousands of issues in PRs, so it is all just white noise. Um, it helps to apply structure, so if there are multiple uh, tests that need to be reviewed by a SIG, I suggest framing it in an email and sending it to that SIG's mailing list saying, look, we need to make the, cover these features or whatever um, that covers functionality of your SIG. Can you please make sure that we have the right people looking at those changes? Okay, and then once it is passed, the SIG level of review by the appropriate uh, reviewers and approvers in that SIG. Uh, if it's just a, uh, a test change for a test not labeled conformance, then it's done and it can just get merged. If the test is already labeled conformance or it is being added to conformance, then one of the conformance approvers needs to be added to that. And there are only four of those right now because we need to you know, onboard more folks. So if you are interested in that, um, definitely volunteer and we can start doing some sort of shadowing, much like we're trying to do with the API review process in Kubernetes. Um, but right now those people are uh, Aaron, Dims, Tim St. Clair and me. Uh, and well, I guess there's a fifth one, Clayton, who sometimes will uh, review things that when he's tagged, but he, he's not as active on that um you know and and even among those people like if you're not comfortable approving because it, you don't have the domain expertise definitely loop in those domain experts um but it's really important that we understand the intent of what the test is supposed to cover and some 
parts of the system are more subtle, particularly on thinking networking, but there are probably others as well. Um, so don't feel bad about poking those folks, but definitely do not rely solely on GitHub notifications. They are worse than useless. So I wanna, um, uh, what am I trying to say? So we've tried a couple different, like let's use a smaller, more focused channel to make sure that people are aware. Uh, there was a project board in the architecture tracking project where I would move things around in the column and then I would try to uh, ping Brian or Clayton directly in Slack and point them at that column when things had stacked up there. That Another, worked well for me actually. Okay, so we could go back to doing that model. Another thing I feel like you suggested on the mailing list when Patrick had a question that he wanted to address was just use the mailing list. We don't often send a whole bunch of traffic on the mailing list and so we could send something about a PR being ready for conformance approval on the mailing list. Yeah, so there's the conformance mailing list, which is super duper low traffic. So uh, I don't have to filter it. Um, and probably other people don't either if they're really interested in this area. They're also the SIG specific mailing list. So again, GitHub notifications are super hard. The teams don't have the right people in them. A lot of people are, are subscribed to issues and PRs and they're no longer the best people or the right people at all, uh, and so on. So I really recommend you know, using other forms of contact. The GitHub notifications are completely unmanageable for multiple reasons. Uh, and adding a little bit of structure and context will help people understand like importance and urgency and the bigger picture around that as well. Right. So I, I understand shepherding around uh, other SIGs. I'm just trying to like, yeah. so what I've, what I want this group to try and get to, to help out newcomers such as Steve who have volunteered to help us with this problem is to make sure that we're all looking at one list that is prioritized according to this group's agreement. That is not something that I personally individually can do. I feel like we owe it to ourselves to prioritize that list and get agreement that that is correct prioritization. So that's why the project board I have linked in the meeting notes has a two triage column and then a prioritized inbox column. Is that what I called it? Sort of backlog column. And then we could be working off of that sort of backlog. But I also want us to use one channel for that um, high signal, hey, we think this is a ready for conformance approval. Uh, so to me, I feel like using the mailing list, which is currently low traffic, would be the path forward, whether that's a link to the PR in question or if that's a link to a column on our project board. Uh, that way we are all looking at the same thing and we're all using the same channel. So yeah. then, beyond that, like I got to stop talking because um, I'm, I'm really focused on 114 and haven't had sure. any time to dedicate to this. Yeah, uh, one thing I can do is basically I'm maintaining, uh, based on uh, some of the areas that Tim asked us to work on, I created a spreadsheet. Uh, I can actually, uh, on a weekly basis, update the status on the spreadsheet and the link that spreadsheet to uh, send it to the work group, a conformance work group uh, mailing list uh, on a weekly basis or uh, to start with. And if that's too much of, emails and I can do it by the way. Uh, Shini, uh, I, I, I like that idea just because you, once we get into some kind of rhythm, uh, then people will say, oh, okay, I, there is this email, there is this four things uh, that, that I can help with, so go do that, then go do something else, right? Okay. So just getting into that rhythm seems to be like the right thing to do here. I agree. Yeah, that's a good, good idea. I, Hip, hippie I, hacker, did you have something to say? We can't hear you. Still can I hear you? Still okay, can't hear you. While we're waiting, I'll just do my usual spiel where I have found that spreadsheets are a source of pain uh, because you ultimately have to reconcile that spreadsheet with the state of GitHub, which is where all of the work actually happens, which is why I would suggest that we try using a project board and consistent use of priority labels, if nothing else, to give us some form of rough ordering in the buckets. Absolutely. If the spreadsheet is what works for you, then please just any anything. 
I absolutely agree, but there are items that um, Globin had questions about whether to start working on those, and there are things that may not show up on the dashboard, so it would be, I my, thought. My response to that would be, why aren't those GitHub issues? Just to, just to better help us visualize this, the scope and volume of work and who yeah. is behind the what. I wanted to echo Aaron's thoughts around not using the spreadsheet and see um, about having someone go through that on a regular basis, like on a weekly, um, and make sure that we have this email um, that's after we've gone through and contacted the SIGs, so going through the SIGs in that week, and then going through the prioritization and, and looking at those tickets with an email. Um, I, don't, I know we've talked about doing the spreadsheet, it'd be good to maybe shadow with where that spreadsheet is now and see if we can't combine those techniques. I'd be willing to step into that. Yeah, and just for my own workflow, I also prefer the uh, GitHub-based solution, oh. not notifications, but the project boards, when they are up to date, have been working well for me. They're easy to discover, they're easy to search, they're easy to manipulate uh, if you're in the right permission set. Um, so it's really low friction. Uh, yeah, that's my preference as well from that's what I, we use in cube docs and it, it does work well. So hopefully we can move as much into that. Yeah, so the distinction between the architecture board and the, the main board is the main board has lots of conformance related tasks in it. And the architecture board was specifically focused on the final approval for changes to the set of conformance tests that that small group of approvers needs to sign off on. Um, so that created a really super high signal place that I could pull when notified through some other high signal channel um, to go work through the set of things that were ready to be worked through. Uh, uh, Doshrini, can you paste a link uh, in the doc, uh, the current spreadsheet itself? Uh, so maybe yeah. that will help uh, go, you know, people go look and see uh, how things should, which which of those columns should go where in GitHub. Uh, like, Well, this is very rudimentary right now, but uh, I will test um, that. Uh, but eventually the idea here is to um, add a couple more columns um, to, to, to see if uh, I, these are uh, blanket um, um, issues and there will be sub-issues that we'll be adding here and what the status of the sub-issue is. Like for example, uh, pre-stop hook, we, we added a new test that is still needs to be go through the SIG uh, to get added and then we'll push it to conformance. So, um, that level of tracking, I cannot do it through project dashboard, but uh, in the spreadsheet, I'm planning to do it. So. Uh, Shrini, uh, there, uh, we use the umbrella issues also for, for like, things like this. So uh, right in the uh, first box, we have, we have the list of uh, items and we check through each one of them when they are done, right? So right. That, that might be helpful as well in addition to the project board. Uh, project board plus umbrella issues should be able to uh, do what you are doing in the spreadsheet right now. Wait, sorry, I'm looking at the spreadsheet and it just has links to issues and that's it's, totally something a project board can do. So right. I don't I understand the, the problem. By the way, in the Kubernetes org, we're also working on a bot that will automatically populate a board from a query. So that hopefully will make it easier to slurp uh, content into project boards automatically. But for this number of things, like 12 things, that they could just be copy pasted into a project board in like two minutes. Right, yeah, I agree, we caught it early. Sounds good, uh, I can work on that. Um, but still we do a weekly email. Uh, yeah. Do we want to assign someone to that? I'd like to step up and be involved in the board and, and SIG, reaching out to the SIGs if we, if someone wants to co-do that with me. Um, or I can just take it. 
I would happy, I'd be happy to help with that and uh, we can coordinate offline. Thanks, Sri. Let's do that. Awesome. Yeah, I, th I think the weekly e or the, the email will really help because I'm sure we're all getting pulled in different directions and I'm going to fall on my sword and say, yeah, I haven't done any reviews because I got distracted on 20 other thousand things. But seeing the email and seeing what's going on will I'm sure help me and also help a lot of you folks who are even busier than I am. That was a good point, Aaron, to point, pull that out. That, that's, that has been happening. It's been a crazy start of the year. I, I mean, I just raise it because to, to champion the individual who's not here, Tim claimed he had like rallied the troops and had uh, was going to bring some review bandwidth to this group. I understand there are people who need to like talk about this, the strategy and the, the path forward here, but we also actually have to have people who do the work. Uh, and so I'm just trying to make sure that we have the right structure in place to encourage that level of growth and then we have the right people showing up. Perfect. Uh, yeah, in, in particular, we had, um, you know, I'd sent out the email about the priorities to the list and there was an action item to convert that to um, issues or something. Has that been done? I am not aware of a one-to-one -one mapping of that having been done. I believe that's why you're seeing the Globant contractors work on some things related to life cycle hooks, in yes. case for termination and things of that nature. All the action items that are listed in that email, they are now issues in the GitHub. I created those, but if there are any others, please do send it to me. I'll create the issues and follow up on them. Um, May I bring up another issue uh, that, um, um, so for storage uh, tests, um, to storage tests, um, we need uh, set up bootstrapping to, to run those tests. So uh, we're creating storage validation suite, kind of uh, like node components. Um, at some point in Seattle, we discussed that um, Instead of calling node components, we should call it as node validation. And similarly, I'm calling the approach to for the storage, uh, adding a tag called storage validation. Is that the right thing to do, or um, is there a, any other? Yes, if it's not going to be part of the conformance suite, especially if it doesn't interact with a as an end-to-end -end test with the whole cluster, then we should call it a validation suite. Uh, this came up, I think, uh, just earlier this week as well, where the SIG node is planning to create a test suite to validate CRI implementations. Um, so I requested that they not call those CRI conformance, that they call them validation, just to reduce confusion. Um, and we're going to need that for CSI. We're going to need that for other things. The big challenge we have with storage, I haven't had time to get back to it, is uh, we don't have sufficient abstraction around all the different volume sources with consistent enough functionality um, that we can really test it in a general purpose way. I think it is possible, but it, it needs more thought. I don't know what the, the current status of that. The SIG storage was working on a proposal at some point, but I put working with them on the back burner to get some of the more basic urgent things covered. Yeah, um, I'm more interested in the general approach so that we can we can have a uniformity in in, in how we tag the test. But um, which which APIs is, would the storage validation cover? The CSI level or the API level or? Uh, it's some some of them are API level. Some of them are CSI level. Uh, there is a list that uh, we're working off of right now, uh, which involves. Uh, um, uh, some amount of uh, things like uh, uh, volume sharing between different pods and, and wait, that's level, so. volume sharing between pods can be done with empty dir and should be portable. So that could totally be just conformance and should not be storage validation. Right, but yeah, could be. You're right. 
um, uh, then there there are CSI driver level host path if uh, or any um, with a default storage class then you, those tests may not be uh, portable maybe uh, in those cases we need to tag it right so right so if it's CSI level I would call it CSI validation if it's um, testing optional functionality that or functionality that might not be entirely portable. Those are just end-to-end -end tests, um, assuming that they are end-to-end. -end. So I don't know that they need a, a specific term to describe them. We have lots of end-to-end -end tests covering, covering such parts of the system. Uh, is the six storage driving this, Shini, or are you, you're doing it on uh, your own? I'm helping out the six storage. They are driving this. Um, they are identifying the test, but uh, uh, again, we need to bucketize those tests, uh, like Brian said, some of them could be, we can blanket call them as storage validation, or we can subdivide them as CSI validation versus uh, uh, flex volume or validation or whatnot, right? Um, because not everything is probably available uh, by default without some bootstrapping uh, on the, on the cluster we are running. So uh, I kind of get it. I mean, for CSI, we can start using CSI validation. I, I cannot think of tests that are not portable, uh, but uh, can fall under the blanket of storage validation. So. Um, well, so an example of portable tests would be, would they have to do with storage would be anything most things empty dir related. There are some exceptions to that, like um, if it's depending on the media type, uh, but you know, local storage empty dir uh, should be portable. It's all the other network attached volume sources that are all non-portable and all optional. Uh, and that's where, you know, I'd ask them to think about how we could abstract that into some kind of basic functionality that could be just represented through the default storage class that a PVC could take advantage of, and those could be candidates for uh, incorporating into conformance some way in the future. Uh, but still, I would just categorize those as they're just end-to-end -end tests. Uh, it's really the extension point validation test where they want to determine, does this flex volume work at all? Does this CSI driver work at all? where maybe we need a different set of tests that are more like the original node conformance tests where they actually launched kubelets as part of the test and just exercise specific kubelet functionality. So those sorts of lower level tests, which don't even have the mechanically aren't even uh, possible to incorporate into conformance when written that way. Those are tests that clearly should have just a different kind of, um, different kind of name where someone who's, building a cloud provider or building a CSI driver or something like that might, might want to run those more targeted tests that just exercise that interface. Yeah. So this is, um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm targeting basically, um, which I'm trying to name them as validation suites if, uh, so to subcategorize the test. So, is that the right approach? Um, and one of the things that I wanted to do is also take the node conformance tests and call them as node validation tests. Uh, but then there will be a lot more deeper impact if I if we do that. I, I don't know. Because right now I don't know if those there are scripts that are already referring them as node conformance tests and things like that. Should we should we provide some direction in how this test needs to be uh, changed, essentially. Sorry. Uh, naming is hard. So uh, let's get the tests in first and then we'll name and tag them, I guess. So to respond to Aaron's last comment, I don't think it's a new way of punting profiles um, because just again, like the examples that have been raised to me in other forums like CRI tests, uh, if it's actually literally just exercising the CRI extension API, then it will never ever ever be a conformance test which requires a whole cluster. So 
for the for those kinds of tests, I just recommend I just pleaded with them not to call them conformance suites because it in the past, like with node conformance, has engendered confusion. Uh, they should just from the get go call them CRI validation or something like that since it has a totally different purpose. So this it's is just, um, yeah. Go ahead, Andrew. The, sorry. So this is the what, continuing one of the items I have. Uh, at the end of the agenda. So say so cloud provider wants to have a test suite um, that validates behavior in, for entry and out of tree providers. Um, so like providers can use that test suite to, to make sure that when they do the switch over that you know, things work as expected. Um, so yeah, I talked to Tim about profiles and he said that was kind of stalled right now. And so I personally don't care what it's called, but I would like to know if or like, I guess like best practices for how we label categorize these tests. Like, are we good to just add a bunch of um, test and tree and then worry about what to call them later? Or do we want a solid plan for what it's going to be called now before we go ahead and add a bunch of tests in there? Would these cloud provider tests use the existing end to end framework or some new sort of integration testing mechanism? So that's something that I would want guidance from this group but it would be much easier for us to, because there's already like a provider framework in the end-to-end -end test. So leveraging that would be nice, but uh, with the whole like out of tree direction we're going, I'm not sure how much it makes sense to be adding more provider specific tests into KK. Wait, but then these, I don't would, wanna... these would be provider specific or these would be generic for all providers? Sorry, one second, I had a phone call. Um, so they're not, so the tests wouldn't be provider specific, but the implementations, like we would still need underlying implementations that do provider specific operations. If that makes sense. So like one example is like the delete node case, right? So the test case or what we're testing for is generic, but uh, we will need, we need to call like an underlying implementation that can call the AWS or GC API and delete a node to validate that behavior. Well, as far as how you mechanically implement this, I think this is a good discussion for the testing common sub project, which I literally have to make a zoom for right after this meeting and their next meeting will be uh, Friday at 730 AM Pacific time. Uh, this is the sub project of SIG testing where we talk about the best practices for how to write and architect tests, just for what it's worth. Um, and I feel like there's a concerted effort to try and extract the provider specific stuff out of the E2E framework. And so that would be the right audience to ask those sorts of questions too. Okay. But I guess, okay. But we know for sure that we don't want to be labeling these tests uh, as conformance. Or like we may have profiles in the future, but that's a different discussion to have. Correct. So what I would do for tests that exercise cloud provider functionality is I'm good with labeling them cloud provider or something like that. So if a cloud provider just wants to exercise the set of tests that's gonna test whether their cloud provider implementation works, there's an easy focus that they can set to do that. And if we, develop a profile that incorporates common cloud provider functionality in the future, it will be easy to incorporate them, uh, but also easy to exclude them right now. So I, so I wouldn't use conformance in the name at all. I would just call them, yeah, like feature cloud provider or something that Aaron is typing in the chat. Um, seems like a good way to go. Sounds Assuming good. that they're gonna use the end-to-end -end framework. Okay, sounds good, thank you. I feel like you're gonna run into the same sort of issue that like CSI stuff would, would run into where there's a certain set of behavior that you expect to work across all cloud providers, but that there, there is also some cloud provider specific stuff that is specific like, you know, maybe GCE offers some things that Azure doesn't offer, that AWS doesn't offer, that sort of stuff. And you're gonna want ways to exercise that, but it sounds like what you're talking about is making sure that there's a minimum bar that all cloud provider implementations meet to do things like node management, storage management, load balancing, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, and uh, pretty much uh, given the profile stuff is stalled, I just wanted to know next steps 
um, for what we can do now. And it seems like we can just add tests in tree, labeling them with feature cloud provider, and then figure out how to put it into a profile later. Brad. So uh, Aaron made a great comment about, hey, we talked about this, but nobody ever wrote this up and it's a little squishy. Um, so, so myself and, and Trini, we'll be happy to, to take a first draft at writing up what we talked about and why we're calling things validation suites. If, if that's okay with everybody, we'll, we'll be happy to grab that, write it up. Because um, I, I mean, I think you all verbally are talking about what we agreed to. It's just, it, 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 anybody who doesn't have that tribal knowledge is going to get frustrated. And I think that was a great point, Aaron. So we'll, we'll take that. Thank you. So, would that be part of the existing best practice document somewhere? or It would not be part of the conformance documentation. It would be part of our testing documentation. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, Dims, I think you had a couple items on the agenda that we haven't gotten to yet. So, uh, uh, Sri, if you remember, uh, we were talking about the adding an end-to-end -end test for the conformance image. Uh, I ended up uh, filing a PR against test infra for that. Uh, please uh, take a look when you get a chance. Uh, right now, it will run only one test. Um, so, just to kick the tires, and it's an optional uh, test which will not be triggered, but you have to trigger, um, you know, by hand if you want to try it out. Uh, so it's so that it doesn't stop anyone. Um, so once we get that working, then uh, I can remove the re restriction of just one test and run all the end-to-end -end tests. So please take a look at that. Sure, uh, I'll give you. Uh... Yeah, it's easy to try it out uh, in your local environment also uh, because it uses kind. Uh, and then it, it has uh, some scripts to uh, build the conformance image and then run the conformance image and get the uh, E to E log and the G unit log out. So, uh, so please take a look at that. If anybody else is interested, uh, Steve, maybe you might be interested also because you're doing stuff with Sonoboy. Uh, this is the Sonoboy image which got imported into the KK repository uh, last cycle and then the cycle trying to do a little bit more with it. Um, I also had a question about whether or not this supersedes an existing PR that uh, Srini opened back in October to try and get conformance tests running with this image. Yeah, uh, I think it supersedes that one. I don't think we made much progress there. We did not make much progress out of the, we need to add the job into the Ooh, right. So I lined up all the ducks in a row now. So there's okay. some changes uh, in uh, KK. I had to make that merge this morning. Uh, Tim, uh, Timothy AC did that. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think there are issues with the image being built that blew up uh, timing of releases being cut. So I'll keep an eye on that. Thanks. Okay. No, uh, we haven't changed how the image itself is built. Uh, I'm not adding it to the any of the make cross uh, uh, any of the things that we use for the release itself, uh, make release, it doesn't show up there. Okay, so then the next question I had was, um, we, I think we talked about publishing an exact list of tests for each release because, um, you know, we, and using that list to, check if uh, somebody, uh, uh, when the conformance uh, folks get, uh, get a text file saying these are the tests that ran, then compare it against that, them, uh, against that list to make sure that it, it, they, didn't, they didn't skip any of the tests, right? Um, do we have such a list? Are we publishing it with any of the releases yet? Uh, like I mentioned last week, I I mentioned about a cap that uh, is is still out there, uh, not approved. And uh, I do have a, a mechanism I'm testing out to build a conformance document as part of the release build, so it will be part of the tar uh, under docs. 
Um, so if that cap goes through, um, so that way the conformance document that will be generated as part of each of the mi minor releases at least, so that they, that can be a reference document. Too. Right. So, so that was the first part of the equation. Then the second part of the equation was, I remember Ben the Elder uh, had a PR out uh, which would take two sets of lists and compare and see if anything got skipped. I think that was the other. So give people a tool so that they can check uh, if they accidentally skipped any of the uh, tests. So I have to go chase that, I think. So I'll do that. Uh, those were the two things I had, uh, Aaron. Okay. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, we don't currently produce a list of conformance tests as a release artifact, and the cap for that didn't make it to implementable status by the enhancements phase. So we're yes. going to have to proceed with what we have been doing thus far, which is a manually produced list of tests being uh, sent to the Kate's conformance repository. I feel like we have a number of PRs that Srini has opened that are a little backlogged on um, uh, Chef Taco's approval, uh, which I can try to poke on some more. I feel like I've been poking the past couple of weeks, but I'll, I can try again. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Wait, so this is different than the conformance.txt file? The list of subset of tests that are included. Yeah, in so I, actually, I'm I'm kind of unclear. That list is is um is hard <laughs> to deal with sometimes because it strips away all extraneous tags, so you just get like some of the text. Uh, the, what I'm talking about is a document that is generated, a markdown document that's generated, um, that contains the the blocks of comments uh, parsed out a little bit. So what release was this test added in? What's the, the description, the human readable description of what this test does, stuff like that. Okay. Are you talking about a machine readable thing, Dims? Um, yeah, so, machine readable was more like it because then we could have a tool which will spit out uh, what this was. Dims, <coughs> so, I just said that. Sorry. Go ahead. This is one of the things we've been looking at with API Snoop was actually to have a uh, <clears throat> basically like a web uh, site to go to where you have each of the APIs and their history of when they were added, uh, when they were uh, promoted to conformance, and <clears throat> what applications within the Kubernetes uh, test hit them since we know their user agents, and eventually what applications in the community are hitting them, if that's of interest. We could also generate the um, user-generated portion if we want to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's more information than we have right now. And it's, I would, I think we need to consider who's going to consume the information, like who the audience is. If there's, if there is anything that is actually checked into the repo, I think it should be relatively straightforward to get it added to the release bundle because we copy a bunch of other files from the release bundle. At some point, we used to include the whole source tree. I don't know if we're still doing that, no. Um, but uh, one thing that I think would be straightforward to do, at least, which I requested recently, and I just put a link to that both in the notes and in the chat, is uh, for anybody who is reviewing changes to the conformance tests, just ask the author of the PR to include a release note. That should be a, a relatively straightforward thing that we can do. Um, that was probably of interest to some set of people. Um, but the release notes, in my mind, are the places where, you know, cluster administrators and people building clusters and uh, Kubernetes providers, uh, as well as, you know, end users should look for, well, what, what has changed that's relevant to me in this release? And we might want to think about breaking down the release notes by audience. That's a lot more work, but um, at least for now, there aren't too many of these changes. Like Aaron said, there are like two in the coming release or something like that. So just ask for release notes on those changes for now until we have a better solution. But that only compares the Delta, but if you are running like 216 and if one or two tests are skipped, there should be a mechanism to compare what's been skipped. That's what I 
think Dave's asking about. So I, on the skipping, uh, I actually commented on this somewhere as well, or maybe I filed an issue. We have a relatively small number of skip directives uh, in the test framework. I think when a test is labeled conformance, we should just set a uh, global variable. And if that thing is set when and skip is invoked, it should just crash. Like we should not allow skip to be invoked during a conformance test. I, are you talking about um, the Ginkgo skip itself, Brian? Because Ginkgo skip will make sure that it never gets to the point where the test is invoked. I'm talking about the skips that are in the code. Yes, in the test code. Less, skip if that sort of stuff. If we yes. could have a linter. Skip pro if provider is blah, blah, blah. I don't even think it needs to be a linter in this case. It could just be an assert. It, yeah, those skips we already removed. Uh, they were. No, I just found to... one. I just oh, found you one. did? Okay. <laughs> ah, okay. That's why I br brought this up. Yeah, okay. I believe Good there's point. also still some confusion in the appropriate regular expression to be used in executing. Maybe we can hammer this out as we hammer out the test image uh, dims, because I felt like at one point in time, we discovered that Sonaboy was using a skip regular expression that included words like alpha, kubectl, feature, whatever, and you and I have been trying to reduce the delta so that all you have to do is focus on conformance, that's it, that's it, full stop, and it should be really easy to generate the list of tests from that. Right. Uh, so uh, just related to that, Steve, are you working on Sonoboy too? Yes, yes I am. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna help out with Tim. Tim, Tim is supposed to be here to help me, help everyone here out okay. some more. So I'm happy to help with reviews, chat with things, you okay. know. Sounds good. So I guess for the next, by next release opens, uh, let's see if we can get to a point where Sonoboy can run the conformance image that is there in the main KK repository. So then we won't have to worry about two images. Um, yeah, that's one of our action items is actually to get that working. Yep, Perfect. absolutely. Thank you. Okay, have we reached the end of our agenda? With four minutes to spare? Four minutes, we, have, we did not talk about the coupon. <laughs> is there anything that... Who is organizing or running KubeCon stuff? Um, I guess that'd be me. Uh, so my, my goal uh, with this one, I've requested a 50 minute session. Um, as a combined session, I think it's more valuable. Uh, my idea was that we spend kind of a, a short amount of time giving an intro to anyone new, but then really actually just focus on making progress uh, on tasks that we have. Because um, I think that's kind of the, the value of, of us actually being there. Uh, so with that in mind, I am I guess, collecting topics. If anyone has something they want to raise, that, that'd that be helpful to kind of hash out in person. Uh, I, I thought, so we did like Windows, for example, last time at, uh, in Seattle. How much more progress do we think we can make than during this meeting? I don't know. Like I, I, one of the main benefits of the um, the last KubeCon meeting was it included people for whom the uh, these video meetings are hard to make, like people from Australia, for right. example. But other, that's like that was like one person. Uh, right. So I'm not going to be there in in Europe, and that probably a lot of other people from the US are not going to be there. So I don't want to have another meeting where we end up just like rehashing all of the content of that meeting during one of these meetings after it. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll put out a call and see actually who will be there uh, so we can gauge on how useful it will be um, and if there's critical mass. Does that sound like a good next step? Yes. Okay. Sure. Um, the only other thing I had for this group was um, I noticed that uh, the K3S folks uh, stripped out etcd and they are using SQLite 3 uh, and we don't have a conformance test and they pass the conformance test too. Uh, so uh -huh. I don't know what we want to do for things like that. <laughs> uh, I Please everybody take a look at that and we'll put it on the agenda for next time and follow up on the mailing list if you find anything interesting with respect to that. Uh, this, with respect to the SQLite 
thing. That is one of the reasons why I said we need to cover all SED dependent behaviors in the conformance tests. We also have the Cosmos DB implementation by Microsoft. Correct. Like people, people are starting to swap this out. So we really need to make sure that the semantics we expect to be respected are actually implemented and covered by the conformance test because workload portability is one of the goals, but ecosystem tool portability, like, you know, there are literally hundreds of operators now. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that those things just work. So um, with respect to the other things they removed, I haven't looked at that in detail. That bothers me less than, you know, coverage of pods and API server and networking. Like those three things really need to be very well covered. Being certified for Kubernetes 1.13 does not mean you are certified for all future versions of Kubernetes. That is true. <laughs> yeah. that, that is correct. That is correct. Yeah, so please follow up on the, on the mailing list if you discover anything interesting and let's have a more informed discussion about that at a future meeting. Sounds Thanks. Good. Sounds good. One minute. Okay. See you all later. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.